Hello, I'm Howard Wetzman. I'm the primary addiction doctor at the Townsend IOP, this intensive outpatient program for addiction that you're starting. Let me add my welcome to Townsend. We're glad you've chosen us to be a part of your recovery. This is the Biology of Addiction lecture. We're going to discuss the nature of the illness, where it is in the brain, and what we can do about it. It's important to understand that addiction is just a biological illness. It's not a moral failing. It's not weak will. It's just an illness like any other. By the time you finish this lecture, you'll know a lot more about it. Most people feel that addiction is a problem. Our society refers to it as a social problem. But decades of treating it like a social problem have not worked because it's an illness. Can you imagine treating cancer or diabetes as a social problem? That wouldn't work either. So we think addiction is an illness, but still others may disagree. So let's look at what illnesses have in common. All illnesses have a cause. All illnesses have symptoms which can be used to define them. Illnesses have a natural history. That is, that if left untreated, the illness will always do the same thing. And all illnesses have treatment. Some treatment may work better than others, but to one degree or another, all illnesses have some treatment. The most important thing that defines an illness is that there's something that doesn't work right some cells or organ system that doesn't do what it should do. An obvious example is a broken bone. You can look at it and see right away that something's wrong. We've all had a lot of trouble accepting addiction as an illness because we couldn't see the broken bone. Now we can show you that bone. What you're going to see here is a cartoon diagram of some of the circuits of the brain that affect and control addiction. This is the ventral tegmental area. It's a group of cells that make a chemical called dopamine. They send the dopamine down that arm to the left and release it at another group of cells called the nucleus accumbens. When the dopamine hits the nucleus accumbens, that's when the magic happens. With enough dopamine at the nucleus accumbens, we have mental focus and motivation. We're able to feel pleasure and reward we have hedonic tone, which means we can enjoy life. When there's enough dopamine at the nucleus accumbens, there's enough of everything. And when there isn't enough dopamine, there isn't enough of everything. And everyone wants the last little bit of whatever it is we don't have enough of, and we get pretty irritable. We feel good when the nucleus accumbens has enough dopamine because the nucleus accumbens sends out a signal using another chemical called serotonin. That signal goes to the front part of the brain where we do our thinking. That signal tells us that everything is okay. When there isn't enough dopamine tone at the nucleus accumbens, there isn't enough signal to the front part of the brain and we don't have a sense of well-being. The nucleus accumbens does something else too. It sends another signal with the brain's own opioids called enkephalins to the opioid receptor in the ventral tegmental area. This sets up a positive feedback loop between the ventral tegmental area and the nucleus accumbens. The more dopamine released, the more enkephalin released. The more enkephalin released, the more dopamine released. If something big gets this going, like a hit of drug, then it goes around and around like that until all the dopamine that was lined up ready to go has been released and there's no more left. The level crashes then. While the level was up, we have a sense of well-being. When it crashes, that feeling of well-being goes away and we start looking for the next hit. This, this is the compulsive use circuit of the brain. This is why we can't just use one. So let's summarize. When the enkephalin receptors are getting enough enkephalin, the ventral tegmental area releases enough dopamine. And when the ventral tegmental area is making enough dopamine and the nucleus accumbens is seeing enough dopamine, we can pay attention, are motivated to do normal things, we can feel reward and pleasure from doing those normal things, and in general, can enjoy life. And when the nucleus accumbens is getting enough signal, it sends a serotonin signal to the cortex, giving us a sense of well-being. When there's something wrong with this system, nothing is okay, and our brain starts looking for ways to fix it.
If we know of something that will raise dopamine, we'll use it. But that will just cause the level to go up temporarily and then crash. And the crash will cause compulsive use. So that was the compulsive use circuit. It has nothing to do with withdrawal. Now let's take a look at withdrawal, which has very little to do with addiction. We'll get rid of the rest of these and move the ventral tegmental area over to the left. This will make room to add a new group of cells called the periaqueductal gray. The cells of the periaqueductal gray have nothing to do with compulsive use, nothing to do with reward and feeling better, and very little to do with addiction, as we'll see. We know this because in the lab, scientists can make sure that an animal is only getting drug in the periaqueductal gray or in the ventral tegmental area. When humans use drugs, they go into every cell of our bodies, and we can't tell the effects at the different parts. So let's say the scientists put a small tube called a micropipette right into the ventral tegmental area and allow the animal to inject heroin right into that area two hours a day. Now, it's not a lot of heroin, just enough to be seen by the ventral tegmental area and not anywhere else. So let's say they do this. They allow the animal to self-inject heroin right into the ventral tegmental area two hours a day. Only two hours a day because if they just left the animal in the cage with the heroin, it would use all the heroin, it wouldn't do anything else uh, until it just died of dehydration and starvation. So they do this for weeks and weeks. The animal's clearly addicted. It has clear signs of compulsive use. All of a sudden, they stop the heroin. What happens? Withdrawal, right? No. No withdrawal. The animal was drug seeking, the animal had compulsive use, and when the drug stopped, the animal had no withdrawal. Now let's reverse the experiment. No heroin in the ventral tegmental area. Instead, the catheter goes into the periaqueductal gray. In this case, the animal will not inject heroin into the periaqueductal gray. There's no compulsive use, there's no reward, there's no drug seeking. But let's say the scientist injected heroin into the periaqueductal gray for two hours every day for weeks and weeks and then suddenly stopped. What you get is profound withdrawal. So the ventral tegmental area has to do with a sense of well-being, mental focus, motivation, attachment to others, hedonic tone and reward. In short, all the things that can go wrong in addiction. And the periaqueductal gray has to do with none of those. Instead, it has to do with withdrawal, which at most is a few day process for someone getting off drugs. And the one little part that periaqueductal gray does have to do with the symptoms of addiction is that it has one of these arms running over to the ventral tegmental area so that when you're in withdrawal, the ventral tegmental area doesn't make as much dopamine and the symptoms of addiction are worse. But again, that's during withdrawal, only for those few days. So let's look again at that cartoon of the reward system and the compulsive use circuit. But this time, let's look at a different circuit, sudden relapse. This compulsive use circuit is in the midline of the brain. We're going to slide it out of the way to make room for another group of cells from the side of the brain called the amygdala. Now the amygdala is where we store our emotional memory. Not our memory of what happened or who did what, but how we felt about what happened and who did what. You may have heard the term euphoric recall. The amygdala is where euphoric recall lives. So if you see something, hear something, smell something that reminds you of using, it's like you get another hit of drug. When that happens, the amygdala releases another chemical called glutamate right into the ventral tegmental area and it's as if you had a hit of drug there. The glutamate hits the ventral tegmental area, the ventral tegmental area makes dopamine, the nucleus accumbens sees the dopamine and makes enkephalin and the whole thing spins up out of control again. Of course the dopamine high is followed by a dopamine crash and all of a sudden now people are off looking for drugs to get that dopamine back because it starts with a sensory cue. This is called cue-induced craving and relapse. So the ventral tegmental area 
makes dopamine, which we need for attention, motivation, attachment to other people, enjoyment of life or hedonic tone, and the ability to feel rewarded by rewarding events. The nucleus accumbens sends a serotonin signal to the front part of our brain. This signal gives us a sense of well-being. The nucleus accumbens also makes the brain's own opioids or enkephalins. The enkephalins go to the ventral tegmental area where they cause the release of dopamine which sets up a positive feedback loop. This positive feedback loop is the origin of the high followed by the crash and therefore is the cause of the compulsive use. It can also be caused by a sudden relapse so we can see how the restless, irritable, discontent feeling of not having enough dopamine can get us to go use a drug. We can see how the crash that follows a single hit of drug can trigger compulsive use. And there's also the problem of sudden relapse. The amygdala sends a glutamate signal down to the ventral tegmental area, which is responsible for cue-induced craving, euphoric recall, and sudden relapse. And the periaqueductal gray is responsible for withdrawal symptoms. So we now know three circuits in the brain. The withdrawal circuit, the compulsive use circuit, and the sudden relapse circuit. Together, these things make up the symptoms that are addiction. I hope I've convinced you by now that addiction is a real biological illness that resides in the brain and that the problems of addiction aren't problems of the frontal cortex or the thinking part of the brain but exist at much deeper levels where there is no conscious thought. The question remains, what are the causes of this illness? The first thing is genetics or heredity. It turns out that there are some very well-known variations in some of the genes that lead to dopamine signaling that can lead to this system not working well. This is a fast-growing area of study and we'll be learning much more about it in the years to come. What most people think that leads to addiction is substance abuse and while it can, it's not a very common cause in our experience. However, using does make the illness worse and a history of using is common in our patients. Every time we use a drug, the dopamine signal goes up too far and too fast. It's like lightning hitting your house. Some fuses have to blow to protect other things. Those fuses in this case are the cells that produce dopamine and the dopamine receptors themselves. So the more we use, the faster addiction gets worse. There are also some particular kinds of stress that we'll talk about more later that can lead to a lower dopamine signal. It turns out that certain kinds of stress can decrease the number of dopamine receptors, which will feel just like we don't make enough dopamine. Now that we know what drugs do, raise dopamine signal at the reward center, then we don't have to think about drugs as the things that come out of a bottle anymore. Now our idea about what's a drug can become broader. Here's an example of all these different drugs all raising dopamine. And if you look at it, you'll notice that nicotine actually raises dopamine the second most of anything on this slide and does it just as fast as cocaine does. That's a pretty big surprise because a lot of people don't think of nicotine as a drug, but it is. In fact, we have pretty good evidence that people who continue to smoke after treatment relapse more than people who don't smoke after they go through addiction treatment. This is probably because their dopamine signal is bouncing up and down by taking the nicotine. You all know that if it bounces up, it can crash down. And one day, one of those crashes will be low enough to trigger the use of the next drug. Well, you might be saying, so what? They all raise dopamine. Big deal. They all didn't bring me here. The Lortab brought me.